Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today, I'm very excited to jump back into our, our regular scheduled program. Now, if you haven't seen the video yet, but about two weeks ago, I posted a video showing what's the plan for 2022. And I mentioned that one of the things I'd like to do is sort of get back and start working on Kubernetes. Now, the reason why I put a pause and sort of we took a detour and was doing like miscellaneous stuff and looking at application structure and all this other stuff was because I didn't think I had enough time to really spend on Kubernetes, given all the crazy stuff that was happening in my life and in the world and everything. And so I wanted to make sure that though, when we get to Kubernetes, I will kind of get the time to work on it. And so I think now is that time. So excited to get back on track. Now, here in part one, what I'm going to do is sort of start and illustrate a problem. Sort of when we did miscellaneous, how I illustrate what a problem is with your directory structure and then show you how Go modules help you to solve that problem. I'm going to sort of do the same thing here. So I'm not going to start off by telling you what Kubernetes is because, yeah, I can do that and you can find out other places too. What, I, what I'd rather do is illustrate the problem that you would run into if you were managing a number of services and then how Kubernetes help you solve some of those problems. Now, Kubernetes is really big, it's very complicated. I am not a DevOps guy. I use sort of these things and learn them basically to understand what's going on and then maybe solve a few small problems. I might have not really problems, but whatever. And that's what I'm sharing with you. So you probably, most likely, need to go somewhere else and find more information or you work on this stuff yourself if you are in a space where you are required to do more DevOps style stuff. This is really for the programmer, everyday programmer, and at work or at home doing your hobby projects, you might end up with multiple things that you might want to run and you can use Kubernetes. Is Kubernetes an overkill? I'll let you decide all of that. I'll just show you, giving you information and you have to make a decision on when you use it, why you should use it, that sort of thing. Again, I'm not an expert in that sort of thing, so I'm not going to be able to go very, very, very deep. Who've been following me for a while know that oh, generally that's not how I do things. I want you to really understand something, get the intuitive feel for it, and it's not about being an expert. Okay, so in part one, what I'm going to do is try and lay out a set of services that you might conceivably have. Again, very simplistic because why complicate things? And then we'll see what the problems can arrive from that. We're not going to actually do any coding in part one because we're just going to lay out the services that we need. And in part two, I'll do the coding. So, okay, with that out of the way, um, let's jump in and take a look at the services, these many services that we have. So let's say we have a book deployment and at home or a company, it doesn't really matter. We'll just call it our deployment. We want to understand what is it that we have deployed. And it's a set of microservices that we're going to be deploying. Now, if you haven't heard microservices before, don't worry about it. All we're going to say of microservices is a service that's really sort of so small. And the reason why I say sort of small is because everybody's going to have a different idea about what small is. Some people will say a microservice is an application that does pretty much one and only one thing. Where exactly you draw the line is up to you, your organization, and basically how you feel. It's sort of like when you draw a line to separate a module, what exactly you put inside of a module or a subsystem. You know, you try to make sure that the things that it's doing is sort of related, but where exactly you draw the line, there's no exact answer for that. So we'll just keep simply say a microservice is a service that does something basically fairly simple. And we'll try and show that here. So for example, I'll say I have a microservice called a counter. And what it does, it generates number, right? It's not that you say count, so that's probably a bad name, but we'll stick with it. It's a counter. It generates number. We don't care where it gets a number from, but that's what it does. It gets it produces a number, and from time to time, it's just doing this repeatedly all the time for as long as you have electricity and as long as you keep it running. It's generating numbers, and it's going to post those numbers to a server. It is the server's job then to take this number that it received from the counter and store it to a database or some persistent store. We're not going to get into exactly what a persistent store looks like. Maybe a database, it's a file, non-SQL store. We're just going to store it, but we need it to be persistent. That way, if we shut down the server and bring it back up, 
it can retrieve that number. Um, also, if we no longer have the comfort sending any numbers and clients were to contact the server, they should be able to get the number, right? So you can imagine that you have some kind of catastrophic failure where the counter went down and the server went down, then you brought back the server and you still want um, to be able to have that number that was last received. Now, I mentioned that um, there's a client that can retrieve the number. So this is gonna be our polar. Not a great name again, but something that pulls the server re repeatedly and it gets the number that the server um, last stored in the database. So it's a pretty simple setup here. Counter generates number, send it to the server, server stores it into the database. At some other time, it doesn't matter when, the polo comes around and it asks the server, hey, can I get that number? And the server sends it back to the polar. Notice the counter and the polar are decoupled and so is our server. By that, I want to really drive on the point that our, our polo could come and ask for a number anytime the counter can send a number anytime the two of them are not connected in any way. So I think that's fairly simple to understand, right? Our deployment here. All right, so we have, that's why I call this mini services, right? Because here we have about three. Now you could possibly think that though, if your data store is also another service, like a database server, then that's yet another service, right? But the ones that we're gonna write are in the sort of like the big boxes. So let's look at the specification for our services. Like I mentioned, the counter is the thing that is gonna post a randomly generated value to the server. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The server is going to save a receive counter value to a persistent store. Okay, we don't dictate what a persistent store is, could be a file or whatever. And also the server is going to be able to serve the last counter value from persistent store, right? Serve it up means somebody asks for it and it provides it. And our polar is very simple. It is just get the it gets the last value from the server. It doesn't know it's the last value, but it was, was always going to be the last value that the server received. Okay. Gets the value from the server. With that said, this is where I'll stop it for part one. In part two, we are going to implement these services or many services. But what I'd like you to do is this. Try writing those three services. They're fairly simple. And we've written quite a bit code of code here. We've done like API, right, and APIs. So you should be able to write um, these three services. So give it a shot. I'll post my implementation and solution um, in a week's time, I promise. I'll post it. And so at that point, you can see, you know, how close you got to a solution. Again, there's no right or wrong so long as it fits the requirement. So however you write it, so long as it fits that requirement that we just laid out for those services, that's the correct solution. It meets the requirement. That's all when you write code. That's all you have to do is meet the requirement. OK, um, there are other things you can think about, but at a minimum, you got to meet the requirement. So give it a shot and then let's sync again in a week and we will write some code and hopefully you've gotten a chance to write some code too. So I think that would be a good exercise. All right, take care, stay safe, and I'm very excited to be starting back with this and see you in the next video. All right, bye.